welcome and get started. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you all of those uh, who have joined. I see already we've got 34 participants and I really appreciate you taking time in unprecedented times, actually. <clears throat> Just to start off by saying, um, INE has planned this webinar for quite some time and we want to keep the, keep the work going. In addition, the INE team is very busy following up on, on COVID-19 and doing our best to support all of you. Uh, but we had scheduled this and we have decided to keep going and continue uh, this also very important work and, and topic. Um, and uh, so just to, to start off by saying that so that you're aware that we are also um, following things closely um, in addition um, to all the many things that INE has been doing before this crisis. Um, so today's um, webinar um, is in partnership with the UNESCO GEM report and in specific a consultation on the 2021 GEM report on non-state actors in education. Um, we're very uh, privileged to have uh, Dr. Joshi with us today, who will be leading the consultation and talking with you, um, and really looking at a few key questions and, and taking the chance to really learn from INEE's wider membership. Um, these key questions <clears throat> are related to the challenges for education in fragile and weak states, looking at a question around the role for non-state actors in crisis affected and fragile states, what are the parameters for regulation and accountability of state and private sector actors in education in emergencies, a question around national and global funding, how can we ensure that private uh, provision strengthens rather than supplants public education? And then really looking at some of the lessons we can learn from countries where the private sector has worked to improve education quality access, um, specifically Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, and Jordan, um, perhaps others. Um, so this is really a chance for, for all of us to learn. Um, we're very pleased that uh, UNESCO GEM reached out to INEE for this consultation and, and I believe the, the community of practice really has uh, something to say, something to share, uh, and a chance for us uh, to actually all learn together. So thank you for joining. I will hand over um, to colleagues uh, so we can get started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, just to say it, uh, a couple things before we hand it over to Priya for a presentation around the 2021 GEM report. One, we are recording this virtual consultation. That said, uh, a big chunk of this consultation will be done in breakout rooms and those will not be recorded. So we'll only be recording what, uh, what we do in plenary here. So this intro section, the presentation, uh, and then anytime we come back to the plenary. So that will be recorded. Uh, for viewing later or sharing, uh, but all the time we spend in breakout rooms will, will not be recorded. Um, the, uh, yeah, so before I introduce uh, Priya, we, we would like to do a quick, um, very non-scientific poll um, to see how you uh, identify and who you, uh, who you work for, basically. So I've launched a poll, you'll see it on your screen. Um, and the first question, of the, the, the question for this poll is for which type of entity do you work? Uh, we tried to make that very, very generic. Uh, if you don't work for any entity or are self-employed, there's an option for that as well. So I'm going to give you maybe just a half a minute here to, to answer the question uh, according to the options given to you and, and just choose the best option for you. We just want to do a, a non-scientific view of see who's on our, who's on our consultation today. Can people see the poll? I'm just uh, yes. wondering, okay. I don't see that anyone has answered it. So maybe that's just a view thing from my, from my side. Hopefully people are answering it. Great. All right, 10 more seconds. If you haven't chosen an answer yet, you have 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. I think that's that about wraps it up. I'm going to close the poll. And let's go ahead and uh, share the results. Can you all see the, oh, see it doesn't seem to have recorded, did it? 
Do you see results? Because I, I don't see them in my view. Uh, I do. Okay. Yes, they're results. Yes. Yeah, they're results. Maybe yeah. someone can tell me what they are, because apparently I'm not, <laughs> I'm not able to see them. Uh, does anyone have a, a view of what the, what the results are and what the percentage are? There's I, no one from the private sector. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Academics and international NGOs and other are the top ones, Peter, with 18%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, donors, 15 uh, Self-employed, independent, 12 UN agency, 6 uh, National NGOs, 3 And I think I got everything, but if someone else sees one I've missed, please say. So the only one that has zero is, is private sector? Yeah, NGO. private sector had zero. All right, interesting. Uh, Sarah, can you grab a screenshot of that? Oh, since I since I can't see it. Perfect. All right, good. Someone grabbed it and, and, and put it there. Excellent. Good. Well, one more quick poll before we, we hand it over to Priya. Um, we're going to do a, a pre and post poll around your feelings uh, about uh, non-state actors in education. So I'm launching a poll here. It's a pretty straightforward <laughs> question, but in general, at this point in our in your life in your work life in this consultation are you in favor or against non-state involvement in education in general you have four options and we'll just give about 30 seconds to answer this one All right, I hope everyone's had a chance to answer. Again, I'm not seeing it, so uh, I will uh, share the results with you all on the screen, but I, I, I don't believe I'll, yep, I'm not able to see them. So maybe someone, Kate or someone can. Yeah, can just... happy to read them out. Yeah. So, um, well, the middle two, mostly in favor, but some exceptions, and mostly against, but some exceptions, got 43% each. Strongly right. in favor, got 13%, and strongly against, got zero. So interesting. Okay, very interesting. Someone will grab a screenshot of that too, hopefully. Good. Excellent. Well, with that, I will now hand over our, our consultation. Thanks for participating, by the way. I'll hand over our consultation to Dr. Joshi, um, who we, we, can, we can refer to as Priya. Um, so Dr. Dr. Priya Joshi is a senior analyst at the GEM Report. Uh, her main research agenda focuses on system-wide consequences of private school growth for the education system. She uses a multi-stakeholder perspective, uh, meaning national, district, public schools, private schools, uh, including parents, uh, and innovative subject measures to understand competition, choice, and quality. Her secondary research agenda focuses on the, sole, on, the, on the role of education for achieving sustainable development outcomes that are beneficial for all, in particular, marginalized girls and youth in cities. Her background is in education policy, economics, and public policy. She has a PhD in education policy from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's in public administration from Princeton University. Um, we are pleased to have Priya with us today and to lead us through the next portion of our consultation um, for a presentation on the 2021 GEM report. Priya, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Dean. And uh, thank you um, to really i &E for hosting this webinar during these uncertain times. I am really glad to be having this consultation and, you know, really good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, and the topic of the consultation is non-state actors in education, which is the topic for the next uh, Global Education Monitoring Report. I realize that many of us may be familiar with this, but uh, just to introduce our organization, the GEM report has uh, been around since 2002 as the EFA GMR. It, was, uh, it has always been based at UNESCO. It monitored the six EFA goals between 2002 and 2015. In 2015, uh, the mandate uh, for the report was extended. It uh, does two things, primarily. It is the mechanism for monitoring and reporting on SDG 4 and how education is linked with the other SDGs. And it also uh, is our role to report on the implementation 
of national and international strategies to help hold all relevant partners to account. So in that sense, we are also an accountability mechanism for education progress in the world. Just uh, these are the reports we published and we're working on uh, since we've been the GEM report. Just to briefly uh, discuss our perspective and approach, we've always had an equity focused approach and I would say that our business has been to clear the clutter, to broaden the conversation, to use evidence in a way that you know, provides a measured view of the world on all of these topics. For instance, when we talked about education and the SDGs, we talked about education as uh, broadly as formal, informal and non-formal learning. We talked about education's interlinkages with all development outcomes, not just environmental sustainability, but also urban development, also peace and security. When we talked about accountability in 2017-18, we uh, talked not just about the punitive mechanisms that seem to have proliferated, but also the structural factors that affect, um, you know, affect, so, uh, affect the uh, accountability system, affect how people's uh, ability to perform their roles. For instance, you know, teacher absenteeism, uh, like we implemented this on teacher absenteeism many, in many countries around the world. That teachers are absent not because they're lazy, but also because of all the structural factors around them. In 2019, and of course, you know, of great relevance to this community, um, our report was on migration and displacement. We recently had an Arab States uh, webinar with INE as well. The, uh, one of the ways we brought in the discussion here was we talked not just about forced displacement and not just about north to south, uh, south to north uh, migration, but also internal migration you know, in, in, in our large countries of the world, like India and China. We also talked about, we also, I think, shed light on the fact that displacement is a far bigger issue in Southern countries than Northern countries, uh, if I recall you know, how, how it was um, received. For inclusion, which, is, you know, which has now been postponed to June uh, for the launch, given our current situation, we have uh, been talking not just to target groups of interest, like you know, people in the disability community or in the gender community, but uh, our approach has been to think about inclusion as transforming education systems so that at the end of the day, target group focused approaches will become less and less necessary over time. If you, if you have systemic transformation that really uh, values no one, you know, leaving no one behind and equity, then maybe at some point we will not require so many target group focused interventions. And our current, you know, our current report, the one you know we're talking about today, is on non-state actors, where the again the discussion, the idea is to broaden the conversation to all the ways non-state actors are involved in education. And the next one is on technology, which you know I guess now is super timely, given that you know technology has uh, given all, all of us who are working on this have been talking about how technology is affecting um, all of education systems, and um, it really is now going to be the test. To see if it will live up to its potential in sort of you know addressing shocks and you know just letting us continue our functions. Um, the GEM report has always uh, placed a lot of importance on education and emergencies. It is a it is a hugely important issue globally, uh, of course, in emergencies, including in education. We've done a lot of work on this, but I would say that these uh, represent some of the highlights uh, of our involvement. The GMR 2011 on armed conflict and education really was an important contribution in this field. In 2016, the chapter on peace talked about um, the, you know, the education's role in, in reconstruction rehabilitation to sort of, you know, uh, to uphold democratic principles. It talked about the importance of formal education as well as literacy programs. So it really covered a gamut of, you know, of, of issues. And as we have just talked, you know, we've uh, we've had a report on migration and displacement. We've had several policy papers on humanitarian aid and forced displacement. We engage with a lot of related institutions like INE and UNHCR on this topic. I would say that you know, generally, we could strengthen our focus on education in non-conflict emergencies um, as a as a group. But of course, we're always trying to improve what we do on this. And you can see our current blog series on COVID 2019's effects on education systems that is ongoing now to see how we're engaging uh, on this topic. So the 2021 report is on non state actors in education. Um, in the other consultations I've done, I've just asked, uh, I've tried to do a poll on like why should we focus on this? And I feel like the responses have been 
anywhere from, you know, they're here to stay, you know, they're important and this, they're important, they are our reality, they're not just providing, they're influencing governments. But of course, for this audience, I think it's, uh, it's, it's probably, you know, even more obvious than other audiences that in a situation where, for, for whatever reason, whether it be for conflict or natural disaster or health, the fact that uh, non-state actors are, uh, the fact that the state is weakened means that the non-state actors typically play some role or the other. So, you know, it is important for us to focus on this. It also, non-state actors also have a, been viewed as being potentially important in the Education 2030 framework for action that they could put, uh, con contribute through multi-stakeholder partnerships. We have uh, tried to be quite comprehensive. We will be talking about four dimensions of the non-state role. We want to examine all levels of education because we recognize that the challenges of basic and basic primary and secondary education and the role of non-state actors in these levels is very different from the role of non-state actors in early childhood or tertiary education or TVET or adult education. And as a, and as a consequence, we're talking to a diverse range of uh, stakeholders um, who are working on all of these topics. Just to quickly go through, I mean, this is probably you know, something to read in the concept note as well. When we think of provision, we won't all, only be talking about schools. We'll be talking about um, support services like, you know, learning, like uh, private tutoring or ed tech, but also non-learning support services like infrastructure and, you know, catering companies and, um, and school, you know, who provide school meals. When we're talking about financing, um, besides our usual focus on household spending and government spending and donor strategies, which all relate to, which in this case, we'll, we'll talk about how it relates to donor, non, uh, non-state activity. We'll also have a more of a focus this year on philanthropic activity and corporate social responsibility and you know, a general sort of corporate investment in, in, the, in education. We know, of course, that evidence in this particular case is quite um, is, is quite complicated to talk about evidence in knowledge generation for public versus private advocacy. We also know that there's a lot going on in terms of influencing through influencing to innovate on teaching and learning or financing and management. And I'm sure many you know iterate, many sort of different versions of this exist in education in conflict and crisis affected contexts as well. And of course, you know, at the end of the day, if uh, private sector and non-state actors are involved in so many different activities, we also need to question whether the regulations that exist are fit for purpose. Do we have, you know, adequate accountability mechanisms to handle all of this uh, activity that's ongoing? So that is, you know, in general, quite broad, but the, the aspiration is to apply this to all levels of education um, with, you know, probably a high focus on basic education, but also adequately to the other levels. And you know these these are just the questions that uh, relate to that structure. Um, the first question is on provision. The second question is on the effects. Like what are, what does the evidence say on what on the on the state of non-state provision? Uh, the third question is about what do we know about financing? The the fourth question is interestingly worded as what influence do non-state actors exert on education systems in the field of ideas? And the last question, as I mentioned, is, is regulation of non-state activity fit for purpose? The, you, you, know, you really have this opportunity, this is our way of engaging with you, but you can also do you know, very specific interventions with us. You can go to our online consultation, you can suggest specific you know, topics and examples and key people. You can email us at gemreport.unesco.org. You can engage with us more generally. Of course, we do a lot more than um, actually just the main report. Uh, we have general reports, we have policy papers. There'll be the launch of the inclusion uh, report. We have blogs, we have background papers, and we also have new products now on it, which are national profiles and racial reports. So, you know, just a whole number of ways to engage with us. And now, as, as Dean mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, we have sort of proposed a few questions that would be irrelevant for, for the next um, part of this consultation. I just wanted to add, uh, you know, the, the sort of last paragraph there is we would really like your views on, on, the, on, the, on these issues from also from a gender perspective, uh, because otherwise, you know, it just becomes like an add on at the end. So it would be nice if, you know, you, you sort of engage with the, with the gender perspective in mind as well. 
We'd also like to know if you have any concrete suggestions on how to track the, the financing discussion, because often what ends up happening is that there's a humanitarian aid, aid discussion, but then the people who talk thematically about issues don't always talk about financing of issues. And uh, as, as I've tried to stress now a few times, it would be good if, uh, to also have uh, learn from you from the different level, on the different levels of education and their, the experiences there, because uh, so many of us are so consumed by the basic education discussion. So um, I hope I've kept my time and uh, over to you, Peter, uh, for now. To, uh, oh, sorry, um, I'm supposed to moderate this part. So I'll, I'll take a few questions, uh, if there are any, uh, so that we, um, and I think we have about 10 minutes. Great, yeah. And, yeah. and if I might, uh, I know we did ask you to keep your mics muted and your videos off, but now it would be a good time to turn your videos on. Feel free to do that. Uh, if we run into bandwidth issues, we will maybe ask to, to turn them off. But if you, if you would like, please go ahead and turn your videos on. And, uh, and this is a time for some general questions about the, GEM, the, the 2021 GEM report itself before we dive, into the, dive a little deeper into those six questions that are on the slide there. So uh, you don't have to start with those yet, uh, just any general questions you may have. Feel free to, to speak up or to raise your hand if you want uh, within the Zoom platform. And uh, yeah, turn on your videos. We, it would be good to, to see, some, see, see some moving faces. There we go. Hi, um, I, this is Lindsay, I just wonder um, if I can ask a question. Yes. Uh, okay, thanks Priya very much, that was really interesting. I'm just wondering um, if you will be distinguishing between the for-profit um, kind of non-state actors who are involved in this uh, versus the, um, the non-profit making um, actors. I, was, I mean, you're covering all I can see under under your provision section, but I'm just, I mean, there is a distinction, quite a big distinction, obviously, um, between um, people who are doing this entirely for profit um, versus those who are actually wanting to, or those who are providing through necessity or other other um, reasons. So I just wondered what you had to say on that. Um, that's a great question. Should we take a few more so that I respond or uh, should I take one by one? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe take that one and gives people a, another minute to think of, of other questions they may have. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for that question. I would say that it's very, it's going to be a very key part of this exercise. Um, it's in the, in the academic literature. Uh, people talk about it as typology, you know, like defining what is state, what is non-state, uh, what are their motivations and purpose. There have been a few people who've tried to come up with these uh, so-called typologies. Um, I, and I agree with you completely that uh, the, there are distinctions. Uh, you cannot lump all of the actors into one group. I think one of the challenges we'll face is, you know, when you take such a broad perspective, when you take the, literally the world in perspective, what it means to be, um, like, like non-profit and for-profit are not, sometimes not enough, you know, uh, the, the fact that uh, like quite a profit-making uh, institution can be, uh, you know, classified as not for profit. Um, whereas, you know, you could have, well, you could have institutions that have to be registered as for profit, but um, are probably, you know, barely scraping by or maybe even under profit, you know, so they are, there are all these complications here. But yes, we are going to take this into account. Uh, we, we have started developing this idea of, you know, how we're going to do, this is going to be one of the, I think, the big exercises we do in the beginning the um, trying to understand uh, the, different, the, the different sort of you know, categories that people seem to value. One of them is for, for, for profit, not for profit. The other is values orientation, you know, religion, like faith-based organizations. The other is, um, you know, whether, <laughs> whether there's even within the faith-based, like what kind of government funding, uh, what kind of role government funding plays in, in that. Uh, because in some countries, faith-based organizations are subsumed under the government system in some countries they operate completely independently so that you know so that that i think um there's a lot of uh, variation in this ownership and management uh, by of schools as well so yes uh, to answer your question it'll for profit non-profit will be one of the things we'll look at um, but it really does depend on whether the governments have 
this as a category of registration you know so yeah okay thank, thanks very much for that thanks Priya. i see that maria has raised her hand she's also left a comment but maria feel free to to voice your question Oh, um, you, uh, yeah, yes, thank you. you well, my question is going to be a lot shorter than the comment. <laughs> so it's about uh, how can we ensure accountability? And how can we minimize risk, especially in emergency situations where the state of these are the weakest? And how can we ensure <laughs> that once the, once the emergency, let's say, is minimized, there can be a sustainable uh, structure that doesn't supplant the public services? but it's encouraged still a public service. And that, as you said, it takes into account the equity criteria and gender dimension. Thank you. Well, I, I do think this was, uh, you've captured uh, the heart of the consultation. You know, I really do. I am sort of hoping to hear from the expertise of uh, people who are working on this on the ground actually, on what does it mean to really have accountability and transparency um, that actually works in a weakened state so that you know it's not sort of a prolonged situation. Um, I, I mean I think we we have um, we have a real challenge here. I, I don't think it's uh, I, I just think that you know we have to sort of recognize that there are fundamental principles that people have worked quite hard at to figure out. You know the, the sort of the the Abhijan, the human rights principles are have to be uh, viewed as quite core to how we think about this issue. Um, the, but, but you know, the fundamental challenge you're talking about, uh, what do we do to make sure that the private provision does not supplant public education? It is, it's, it's sort of what we said in the accountability report. I mean, are we, are we you know, because in so many of these conversations I've had, the, um, like who, who, has the, who has the sort of ability to hold like a behemoth accountable? Right? So, so the question is, if we can all collectively work to make sure that, you know, there is pressure on, on specific aspects of these uh, challenges. Um, one of the things that we will clearly focus on is regulation with an equity perspective. Does it, uh, is the, you know, is, is a regulation, is the regulatory system, like however limited it might be in many contexts, including in emergency contexts, is it actually there to facilitate uh, a system uh, and, you know, the institutions in the system? Or is it actually there to facilitate, you know, or a thousand flowers bloom and, um, and, you know, sort of like focus more on the short term versus the long term. So I feel like, you know, there are answers probably institutionally and academically on these broader points of, you know, you need to have long term solutions, you need to have, you know, medium term solutions, short term solutions. But I, I really think that we have to, you know, work out this question together. Uh, there have to be principles we have to bear in mind. And um, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'd leave it at that because it's not, it's not an easy thing to answer at this stage. Thank you. Thanks. I have an answer, actually. Do you have Thanks, something <laughs> from your exper exper expertise? Hi, this is Nina Weisenhorn from USAID, and I'm not sure yes. if this is bleeding into more of the discussion or, yeah. you know, yeah, but yeah. It's, I would like to kind of challenge this idea that private school actors are only behemoths. I think actually the vast majority of non-state um, providers are actually quite small, quite community-based, and and working outside the, the and on a, without any view of governments or donors. And so I would like to challenge this kind of preconceived notion that the non-state sector is somehow working in concert and in a, a large force pushing out state provision. Because it, especially in crisis and conflict environments, what USAID has found through our research is that there's a huge continuum of non-state investment in providing education. And while the headlines may be captured by large multinational, private, uh, for-profit, uh, non-state actors, when you look at the number of children who are probably accessing non-state service provision um, in crisis and conflict-affected environments, it's not 
it's not generally those actors. And, and the other non-state actors are filling a gap and meeting specific community-based needs that perhaps the, the public sector is not able or willing to, to meet. So I, I would kind of, I just want to challenge kind of that sentiment a little bit so that we're not lumping all non-state actors together uh, in, as a monolith. Over. Yes, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have used the word behemoth. Um, I mean, I think the, the basic thing I'm trying to say, I was not trying to talk about a specific uh, big chain, a multinational. I was trying, I was trying to sort of compare the, the you know, the, in this conversation around uh, regulation or, um, you know, just the general idea of a weakened state and how in that context, uh, the private actors as a collective, um, which, you know, includes a diverse range of um, providers and influencers and advocates, that um, the relationship is different there as compared to a, a situation where you have a functioning state where, you know, again, they could entertain the same range of, you know, diverse, small or large actors. So that was my point. Uh, it wasn't uh, to sort of, you know, say that people, they're not, private actors not playing a role. Because I think uh, there are two types of conversations happening. Uh, there are two types of points here. One is the, the question of, you know, we want at some level, right? I mean, we want the state to be functional and to hold, uphold this right to uh, uphold the right to education because it is mandated to deliver on this responsibility. Um, and in a weekend state, um, how are we going to, in a weekend situation, how are we going to make sure that the state is actually able to uphold its duties, including not just in provision, but you know, in regulating and upholding institutions. Um, yeah, I take I take back the word behemoth in this conversation. Thanks, thanks, Priya. Thanks, Nina. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to move to our breakout rooms soon. Yeah. But just to let everyone know that there are, there were some questions and a couple comments posted in the chat area. Uh, we'll see if we can get back to those, and some some of that, of course, will inform and hopefully will inform and will be answered, in fact, during some of the discussions that we'll have now in, in breakout sessions throughout the rest of our, our hour together. Um, uh, we've noted those questions and maybe we can get back to those during uh, later plenaries as well. Um, so with that said, um, we are gonna break out into some, some smaller groups uh, for short periods of time. We uh, anticipate that we will probably, yes, we'll be sending you into breakout rooms, as they're called, of five, participants. Uh, don't worry, it's very easy. We'll send you out and we will bring you back. Uh, there won't be anything too technical that you have to do. Uh, it's really just to facilitate some more intimate engagement around these questions. Each session, each breakout room, will focus on one question. If your conversation strays <laughs> into other questions, we, we're not going to stop you on that. Uh, but try to focus on the question at hand. Uh, so uh, we'll go through and we'll try to do this six times. So bear with us. Uh, there'll be relatively short sessions, probably at this point about eight minutes long. Um, so as soon as you get into your breakout room, I do encourage you to, to dive into the question right away. Um, you can all see your names and organizations, so don't spend a lot of time doing introductions if you can help it. Um, and if you would, try and find someone, have a volunteer in your, in your breakout room uh, to, to help moderate the discussion. Uh, if possible. Again, it's very loose. You're a small group, so don't feel that it has to be moderated too heavily. Um, and, and also, if someone be, would be willing to sort of jot down some notes in your group, please raise your hand right away once you get into your group. Uh, again, not critical because uh, we have other ways to record uh, your comments and questions. In fact, that uh, brings me to the topic of jam boards. So in the chat, Sarah has posted um, a link to what are called jam boards. And these jam boards are open whiteboards, basically, where you can type any comments or questions that you have. We've laid out six jam board sheets, uh, one for each question. And we would love it if you posted a sticky or drew a picture or whatever you want to do within that jam board to indicate your, your reaction or inputs to the question at hand. So as you'll see, there are uh, at least six sheets there, but one sheet per question. Feel free to post uh, at any time. Now, during your, your breakout room chats, uh, during the next plenary that comes up, um, or however or whenever, even after this consultation, you the Jamboards will still be live for a, a little while. 
there will be opportunity also to respond a little bit more in writing uh, to a basic survey. Again, mostly just asking these six questions. So if you have more to say that you're not able to either verbally say or, uh, or, or type into the Jamboards today, um, there will be another opportunity for you to, to, to input um, after the fact. I'm going to pose the same question that we posed to you earlier, which was about your feeling of being in favor or against non-state involvement in education. Answer it how you feel now after 90 minutes of this discussion. You have about 15 seconds to answer. Smaller sample size, we're a bit reduced from, from our original numbers, but uh, we'll, we'll see what, how the percentages map out. Great, has everyone had a chance to answer? Yes, a lot of nods, yes, good, good. All right, I'm gonna yes. end the poll. And since I still can't see the results, I'll share them here. And Sarah, uh, I think is gonna talk us through the comparison from before and after. Yeah, I'm gonna try and I might be having issues. Um, a slight shift towards mostly in favor, um, but some exceptions. Um, so strongly in favor of, yeah. was previously at 13%, and now it's at 9 um, Mostly in favor, but some exceptions was at 43%, and now at 50 43 to 50. Some exceptions okay. uh, were at 43 and now 36. And strongly against, there were none previously, and now there's 5% and 1%. 5% and 1%. Okay, interesting. All right, well, well, we'll grab a screenshot of that too and share that for what it's worth. A very non scientific survey, but at least uh, something to gauge <clears throat> how we're feeling. Uh, I want to end it here, let you all go and move on to other things. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much to Priya for, for leading us through this and to Kate Lincolns of GEM Report also for helping organize and being patient with all the, the postponements of this, of this session, but we're really glad we were able to do it. Um, you will see follow up from INEE on this topic throughout the rest of the course of GEM Report's uh, development of, that, uh, of this report. Um, including in the survey, as I mentioned, and uh, obviously the best place to stay uh, familiar and, and aware of INE happenings and, 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 and content is on the INE website, INE.org. Um, thanks again to all. Glad you could join us and mm -hmm. uh, have a great evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. From Tanzania, it is evening now. Thank you. Bye. Good evening, yes. <laughs>